Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, J'ai maintenant le plaisir de vous présenter le président du conseil d'administration de la Fondation pierre Elliott Trudeau, M. John McCall McBain. La plupart d'entre vous connaissent déjà John, mais je me, donc je me limiterai à vous dire que John a connu une brillante carrière d'étudiant à l'Université McGill, avant d'ensuite briller dans une deuxième carrière comme homme d'affaires impliqué dans le commerce mondial, et ensuite dans une troisième comme philanthrope. John a soit fondé, soit grandement aidé le Rhodes Trust, la European Climate Foundation et la Fondation McCall McBain, pour ne nommer que ces trois. J'estime que le travail de la McCall McBain Foundation est intimement lié au thème du prochain panel, alors accueillons John McCall McBain. Merci beaucoup, Jennifer, et um, je voudrais rejoindre les autres personnes qui, uh, qui pensent à Paris aujourd'hui. Moi, j'ai habité à Paris depuis entre 92 et 98, et je me souviens beaucoup de la joie de la ville. Et j'ai parlé avec quelques personnes hier soir que j'ai vu un peu la peur de la ville. C'est un peu, c'est très triste, et je rejoins de, aux commentaires bien, bien uh, pensés de, de Jennifer pour cette uh, tragédie que j'espère ne va pas continuer à, ni à Paris ni à d'autres endroits. Um, Look, I'm sorry not to have been here for yesterday. I arrived very late last night. I was at the, at the uh, Rhodes uh, Trust meetings. But uh, I'm happy to see the, the variety of opinion. Um, I think today's, the conference is great in terms of, especially the title, you know, fail, adapt, and innovate. And you think, well, hold it, don't we want to succeed? Well, sometimes to succeed, you really have to fail. So I learned that, unfortunately, too often. Um, so my career, as Jennifer mentioned, was starting as a business person. I was the We called ourselves the Pac-Man, eating the back of the daily newspapers, um, which are very traditional bound organization, which didn't have a lot of innovation. And we had Auto Trader and other uh, classified advertising papers eventually on the, on the web, and really were able to innovate in that sector and made it into a, a business all over the world and, and uh, allowed me to transform into, into now a philanthropist. Um, but what, what that experience taught me um, was that organizations with complacency non-innovation, because they've always done it that way, are suspect and risk, and really at risk. And we look at the daily newspapers today and the troubles they're having, and obviously the trouble for our community and society given journalism issues, but um, it's been something that's, uh, that's worrisome in, in terms of we don't want that same problem to happen to our government, because our government can't go out of business, like uh, some of the newspaper companies may. Um, so last year, as we know, after 12 years of operation, the Trudeau Foundation decided to basically, as I think our great President Morris has said, increase our impact. And we can do that, yes, by choosing the right fellows. We can do that by having great mentors to work with our, our scholars. But at the same time, we can also do that by improving and, and having more effective public interaction. And this conference is part of that. I think everybody's aware of our, our three areas of uh, inquiry now, pluralism, diversity, and the future of citizenship. That's the first. Indigenous relations in Canada. Um, and uh, maybe we should look outside Canada for some great models as well. And thirdly, water, food, and energy security, which I put my personal interest in climate change in that one, but I think it's, a, it's an important one. So our conferences are, are trying not just to be an individual topic, but try to take them over a period of time so we can do the proper research and allow the impact through policy impacts um, in our governments to try to make this a really impactful group and not just great thinkers, but staying there and doing nothing more with it. Um, so I don't want to take a lot of time here. I'm very happy to be um, introducing this panel. I think you're going to introduce it. But I was just going to say there's one member of this panel who's one of the reasons I'm a philanthropist, I think, is, is Tim Evans. And uh, many years ago, I think it was 2007, Tim, was it? 2007, Tim took uh, my wife and I to Kenya where we saw a really innovative program. And it got us stimulated to do work in Africa. We've been doing work um, on different issues in health, especially we're doing a lot of work on maternal mortality issues. Uh, we had clinics in Liberia, West Africa, OBGYN clinics, which had people walking 100 kilometers just to go to that clinic in Bong County in Liberia. We've also done work on the opposite end of maternal issues, trying to find a solid form of oxytocin as opposed to liquid form which needs to A, be injected, B, be refrigerated. Um, and so this one that we hope that the inhaled someday trials go well on that, and we worked in collaboration with many people, and uh, including at the end, we've got uh, $18 million from uh, GlaxoSmithKline to help work on that, those trials. So we're hoping that will save hundreds of thousands of, life, uh, of lives around the world in maternal issues. So I think innovation is really important in healthcare, and Tim 
as other great panelists, but I know Tim personally is really on the edge of that and on, in an organization which could have some effect at the World Bank, um, which hopefully Tim can get moving even more on those issues. So with that said, um, I'd just like to introduce Stephen Hoffman, our, or your host for the, uh, this panel. And uh, Stephen, I'll let you uh, uh, introduce everyone else. Stephen's a professor of law and director of uh, the Global Strategy Lab for the University of Ottawa. And he holds positions of a master as well as Harvard University and also does other consulting work and has done articles in even the National Post sorry, and the Globe and Mail and other, other publications. So, Stephen, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, let's make some change in this world. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the foundation, um, uh, Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, Jen Petrella for uh, or allowing us to organize this panel and talk about uh, Ebola and global institutions uh, as one of the key issues uh, during the course of this conference. I think everyone in this room uh, knows about uh, the Ebola outbreak. This is really one of the defining uh, news stories of the last couple of years. It's not just a defining news story because of uh, the, the human consequences. Uh, as of today, almost 30,000 people uh, have contracted Ebola in this particular outbreak in West Africa. And then as of today, uh, 11,314 have died, uh, plus many more who, who've died and who've been affected because they haven't been able to access health services uh, in West Africa, uh, and then particularly in the three countries most affected. But the reason this is, uh, it was also a health news story was because of the extent of the, of the public interest and fear that this outbreak generated. This was an outbreak that really highlighted the extent to which our health and well-being in places like Canada and everywhere around the world very much depends on the health and well-being of people everywhere and very much highlights the extent to which we're dependent on global institutions being effective to both identify these risks, manage them, and then respond appropriately. Now, uh, with Ebola, it was very clear that there's, there's lots of news media coverage. Every day it was uh, front cover above the fold for several months. And one of the interesting things, I thought, with the news coverage was to the extent to which it really flagged some of the institutional failures that, uh, that we saw in global health. But those institutional failures really only representing uh, a tip of the iceberg in terms of the types of global institutions that we rely upon for other issues. I'm thinking climate change, uh, I'm thinking uh, illicit financial flows or smuggling of various products, um, uh, trafficking, migration. We have so many issues where we depend on global institutions uh, that this, this coverage of Ebola really was one opportunity, one window into the kinds of global health institutions we need versus the kinds of global health institutions we currently have. So for this panel, we're going to be focusing, on, focusing in on, on Ebola as, uh, as a window into all of this. Uh, we're going to first start to talk about some of the failures through a conversation with the panelists. We'll, have a, we'll talk about some of the institutional failures that we saw. We'll then follow uh, with the conference theme, talking about some of the adaptations that we saw in the light of the Ebola outbreak. And then finally, uh, towards the end, we'll begin to talk about what kind of global institutional innovations might we have seen or might we see in the near-term future? So without uh, further ado, please uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our esteemed panel, uh, with whom I'm really quite honored to share the stage and, uh, and to moderate this conversation. The first uh, to my left uh, is Hossam el Sharkawi. Hossam uh, has had uh, 25 year, over 25 years of experience responding to humanitarian uh, crises uh, really all around the world. Currently, he's uh, director uh, for the Canadian Red Cross's Emergency and Response uh, portfolio. So what that means is when there's a crisis, he's the one who's really leading the charge within the Canadian Red Cross to activate it, and he's there making sure that uh, our, the Canadian Red Cross is doing what it can to respond. Uh, has a doctorate in uh, health policy and management, and uh, has really been one of the uh, people in Canada who's really leading in terms of thinking about how can we make sure that our global institutions and our Canadian institutions are able to be ready for the next uh, outbreak that will inevitably happen. Beside uh, Hossam is uh, Laurie Garrett. Uh, Laurie um, is someone who was also has been spent, spent much of her career, most of her career, uh, reporting on and then analyzing disease outbreak after outbreak. She was there in 1995 in Zaire when there was an Ebola outbreak, covering that uh, news story, and has since uh, really went, if there's an outbreak, an infectious disease outbreak that's been happening in a place around the world, she's been there covering it. 
She's also the only, a journal, a, she's a former journalist, and as a former journalist, she's the only one who's ever received the three big P awards in journalism, so the Polk, the Peabody, and the Pulitzer, which uh, for those who know about those awards, that means that she's had a career spanning both print and broadcast journalism. And now she's uh, the Senior Fellow for Global Health at the Council on Foreign Relations, a think tank, um, uh, which, and she's based in, in New York, and she directs a global health program there, which is quite exciting. To the left of uh, Lori is, uh, is Tim Evans. Um, I first met Tim uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, I was staff at the World Health Organization. He was my boss's 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 <laughs> boss. <laughs> or I guess he was my great grandpa boss. Uh, and uh, so at that point, that meant that he was, I was, I was here. He was the assistant director general. Uh, of the World Health Organization, uh, responsible for quite a large portfolio. Before then, uh, uh, Tim um, was a doctor, a Canadian, graduated from medical school here in Canada, and then went uh, did various things, including uh, working at the Rockefeller Foundation, then WHO, as I mentioned, and after that, and what he's currently doing, is he's the Senior Director for Health, Nutrition, and Population at the World Bank, which has really taken on quite an interesting role in this outbreak, which uh, we'll be hearing a bit about. So let me uh, turn it over to the panel. Um, my first question I want to ask uh, all the panelists, uh, and maybe uh, Tim, we can start with you, and then uh, Laurie, and then Hossam. From your unique vantage points of where you were working during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, from your perspective, what was the single greatest institutional failing, global institutional failing that you saw during this pandemic? Tim. Great, Steve, and thank you very much. And, uh, Thanks to uh, uh, the Trudeau Foundation for putting on this uh, meeting. Um, uh, as the granddaddy, grandpapa, I, I'm a little bit taken off guard because I was hoping I've had a little, I would have a little bit more time to think. Uh, my cognitive processes are a little bit slower uh, as I get into my ninth decade. Um, or having just landed uh, from Indonesia this morning. <laughs> However, um, a, a great question. Um, I, there, I think the biggest institutional failure um, is a failure of values. And, and I think the fundamental value that was missing uh, is uh, a recognition of the indivisibility of global health. And, and I say that not to be esoteric, uh, but um, uh, I think uh, had we had systems that valued the lives of two-year-old children in remote places of Guinea as much as they value the lives of two-year-olds here in Ottawa, uh, we would have a very different structured and financed global health system uh, which would have assured us that this unusual illness in a two-year-old in December of 2013 uh, would have been picked up uh, much, much, much more quickly. Um, if you want something a little bit more granular than that, um, I would go to the first uh, area of focus of the Trudeau Foundation in terms of pluralism, because I think um, this is uh, related, uh, this uh, is an institutional effect, uh, failure related uh, to collective responsibility. And I think it's a big mistake to try and uh, pin uh, the blame on any single institution here. Uh, for those of us who've studied patient safety, uh, uh, there's a wonderful model which suggests that the reason we have unsafe health systems is because of Swiss cheese, the Swiss cheese effect, meaning there are multiple holes, meaning there are multiple places where you have relative systems failure uh, which add up to catastrophic uh, mistakes. So um, uh, that, I think, is the, uh, the primary problem uh, that we were uh, facing. Uh, I go back to the values issue. Uh, I think if we had seen a similar problem in another part of the world, uh, there may have been more attention to it more quickly. Um, I think the fact that this was happening in a poor part of the world, a relatively unknown part of the world, uh, allowed it to fester much longer than it should have. Uh, and I think that reflects, uh, again, uh, a collective failure of, of, of uh, really valuing uh, the, the lives of those citizens uh, equally uh, in, in health terms. And that gets me to my political message on the third priority of the, political, of the uh, 
uh, of the Trudeau Foundation is I, I fully expect them to move from a focus on food and water security to health security as the, on, on the basis of this panel. Great. Uh, Laurie? Um, when two-year-old Emile was poking around in tree stumps uh, with the other kids in his village of Meliandu in Guinea, torturing bats that were living inside of the stumps of otherwise dead trees, the first failure was uh, that the world wasn't paying attention to the impact of deforestation and massive climate change and what that was doing to bat populations across Africa. So poor little Emil pokes around and he ends up acquiring this strange disease as the first case shortly after Christmas 2013. The virus spreads within Meliandu and from Meliandu to neighboring villages uh, in chain of transmission that largely goes unnoticed and is misdiagnosed as possibly cholera, possibly this, possibly that, anything except Ebola because Ebola wasn't on the radar screen for this region of Africa. But the real question is why it, once it was recognized, which was around March 20th of uh, 2014, um, and the world did mobilize the first scale of response with technical experts from the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, Institut Pasteur, uh, WHO, and so on, going to the ground. Um, why did they miss uh, at least two chains of transmission entirely, focus on one chain of transmission, and by April declare the situation's under control and we can leave? And then, of course, as MSF is screaming from the trenches, you're wrong, you're wrong, we've got cases pouring in. Uh, they are treated as if they're nutcases uh, out there in the trenches. What are they screaming about? And you don't get an actual declaration of a state of emergency from the World Health Organization all the way out until August 8th of last year. So the institutional failure, to my mind, is, is threefold. One, that we don't have any institution that actually is surveilling and declaring regarding the state of the forests of the world and the, the in particular, threatened populations that we know to be important pollinators, but also disease carriers, the bat populations. Second great failure is to be able to make an appropriate diagnosis earlier in December, January, February. But once you have one in March, how dare you leave the field? How dare you leave the field? This would be like thinking, you know, we kicked the ball, we got the touchdown in the first quarter, we were ahead in the second quarter, we didn't bother to come back after halftime, because basically we'd won the game. Um, and so the, the real scrutiny of the world right now, in terms of a, a variety of different investigating panels and international committees and so on, is on that time period from April roughly when everybody left to August asking where was everybody? Why did you have to have people dying in the streets of Monrovia, in, literally in the streets of Freetown and Conakry before finally you get this global response? And then I guess the secondary is I'm, I am not a big fan of the UNMIR response. This is the United Nations organized response that came uh, beginning in September with recognition that WHO had failed and that the epidemics were out of control. And I, I feel that if time permits, I'm prepared to dive deeply into what was wrong with that. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about Anmir uh, shortly. But uh, Hassan, what was, from your vantage point, what was the greatest institutional uh, failing, global institutional failing that we saw in this pandemic? I'd like to compliment my colleagues, bring this to the human level. The, it is essentially a failure um, to recognize that this was different. And this applied to not only global institutions, but also uh, in the field level, at the ground level. Um, Canadian Red Cross responded in March with our colleagues from the French Red Cross, by the way, in Guinea. And, and I must recognize them as well, by the way. We were in touch last night with the tragic and terrible events of Paris to see how we can help 
uh, our colleagues at the French Red Cross in, 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 in responding to what they faced last night, but they were also one of the first. And we are still working today with the French Red Cross in Guinea. Um, but many of us in the humanitarian world, at the time in touch also with our colleagues from MSF uh, in the early days, maybe were lulled by past experience. There wasn't experience to suggest, okay, early on, that this was going to be anything different. And it's a human nature thing, I think, to challenge ourselves to think the unthinkable and to think and project new scenarios and then resource them and act. Um, that's difficult to do, whether it was the Japanese earthquake and tsunami, whether it was Katrina and, and other events. So Ebola was, was in my world um, of response, mobilizing to response, was largely seen initially as what we call a, as a silent disaster. And my team and I face 15 of those every week across the world. They don't make the news, they're not, they don't have the CNN effect. Um, and we respond to two to three across the world. I mean, some of you may know about the, the population movement now between Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi. It's been happening for months. There was a cholera outbreak, the drought in Guatemala, and others. And I think Ebola had that characteristic initially. It was just going to spike slightly. It's going to kill a few hundred people, and it's going to end. And I think that dictated a lot of the initial failures to recognize how serious this was. Laurie, I want to pick up on uh, when you, you, you highlighted one particular institution that um, should, would probably have had a role in this and, sh and did have a role in this, but that there were, there were some failings. So now to go against your advice, Tim, uh, for this question, I want to focus in on the World Health Organization. And uh, so this is, uh, I mean, in much of my research, I've studied WHO. And uh, one thing that was interesting about the Ebola outbreak was that uh, suddenly my parents, my grandparents, my friends knew uh, suddenly about what I was studying. <laughs> they, we heard about the World Health Organization quite a bit, and a lot of blame was put on them. Uh, so understanding they're one of many actors in the system, let's do look at for a second, what are some of the big failings that we saw? What happened with WHO that uh, they got such blame in the media and that uh, people uh, everywhere seem to know that WHO dropped the ball in some respects? So maybe, Laurie, I can start with you. Well, doctor, he's brand new PhD, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, it, would, it would mean sitting here for several hours to get through the list of failures, mistakes, misjudgments, um, resource problems, and so on. It, it's a long list, but it boils down to a couple of key features. The World Health Organization was created, like most of the UN-related institutions and the Bretton Woods institutions, after World War II in a 1940s world uh, with the rise of the Cold War in the background and with very much a bifurcated power structure of everything on the planet. So you had you know, the communist Soviet-aligned world and the NATO-US-aligned world, the capitalists, the communists. It was, a, it was a relatively easy world to work in, frankly, because uh, most of the smaller states um, obeyed according to the power structure of their relevant side. If you could broker a deal that a capitalist and a communist could agree on for health, then you could eradicate uh, smallpox. Um, but the institution no longer fits, and this is true with many of the UN institutions, it no longer fits the world we live in. Not only are we not a bifurcated world, we are a world so splintered and fragmented that it is extraordinarily difficult to get consensus on anything. No major new treaties, no major new agreements. You know, there had been hope for the Paris summit. Now the question is if it will even take place because of events in Paris uh, yesterday. Um, and so WHO, um, and I'm sure Tim will talk more about this. WHO was created as a technical advisory institute, but the world today wants an institution of some kind, whether it's WHO or something that doesn't currently exist, to be operational and to guarantee the safety of the planet in the face of microbial outbreaks. This WHO has not been fit for that purpose. 
It is not, does not have that capacity. And yet, institutionally, it's very eager that on the stage of international institutions, it have primacy. It play the numero uno role. Its, its actual role in the global health governance structure has diminished dramatically over the last roughly 15 years as the amount of money that's surged into global health has gone up tenfold but dispersed to mostly other agencies such as Gavi, the uh, vaccination agency, UNAIDS, the HIV AIDS agency, the Global Fund to fight AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria and so on. Um, so when, when Ebola appears, the state of WHO is, is, can be summarized as the following. One, it has about 1.2 billion less dollars than it had in its coffers uh, two years previously. Two, it's done a 20% across the board set of layoffs. And three, its own World Health Assembly, which is the governing body, one country, one vote, Vanuatu equal to China, um, had re voted, voted to gut its disease response, pandemic awareness and epidemic uh, organization called GORN the, and, and all of its uh, capacity to deal with diseases. And number three, its own authority on the landscape and architecture of global health had greatly diminished. Um, so all of that provides a set of excuses. Nevertheless, Leadership is leadership, and if the leadership of WHO had chosen to take the bull by the horns and really, you know, charge ahead on fighting this epidemic and bringing the resources to bear, mobilizing the world, even if it didn't have the money itself, but mobilizing the world with its resources to go and assist these desperately poor countries, this epidemic would have had many thousand fewer deaths. Tim, uh, I'd like to throw it to you as a, so you're, you're now, um, you're a former insider and now, uh, but someone who's now heading health at the World Bank and outside of WHO, but uh, in an ent with an entity that uh, works very closely with WHO on a daily basis. Um, from your perspective, what, what went, what happened? What happened to our World Health Organization? Well, Steve, um, I just wanted to begin where Lori began and recognizing your, your new doctorate. Um, <laughs> and uh, I know you've got the final word on this as a doctor of, of global health policy. Uh, but I do want to just bring your attention to history for a second because I'm not sure you were born in 2004. Um, <laughs> you look too young. Um, Thank you. But at that time, there was a rather well-known mayor of, uh, of, uh, of Toronto uh, by the name of Mel Lastman. And Mel Lastman um, uh, uh, was the mayor during the SARS outbreak. And, and he had a rather famous uh, question. I, I'm not sure if he ever found out the answer, but he asked, who is who? Who is WHO? And he asked this question at a time when WHO has, had actually exercised the powers that it is provided in its constitution and through the international health regulations to impose travel restrictions and advisories. And WHO had issued a travel advisory with respect to Toronto. And this was a huge wake-up uh, uh, call and it raised a lot of anguish and concern uh, related to the economy in Toronto and, and perhaps uh, escalating the concerns of, of SARS too much. But it was WHO at that time acting in the expected role that it is not only um, uh, you know, uh, able to uh, but should exercise in the, in the context of these crises. So my first point is that it isn't that WHO doesn't have the mandate. And Laurie's point that it was set up as a technical institution, um, in part thanks to the, the wisdom of Brock Chisholm, uh, who was a former Deputy Minister of Health in this country, um, who had rather unusual ideas about Christmas and its impact on children. 
which is why he was banished to San Francisco to work on the charter of, uh, of WHO in 1946. But, but um, that, um, um, uh, that technical agency was deliberately uh, designed to have an arm's length from the political so that it could take tough decisions. And the constitution of WHO does provide it with that mandate to take decisions which are not politically determined uh, by its member states, but are in the interests of global health and global health security. So that, I think, is, is one issue which was a misinterpretation or a failure to really uh, abide by the constitution and the powers that exist within the existing uh, international health regulations. The second was a failure to act, and, and here John McCall McBain talked about complacency. Uh, and I think that WHO as an institution uh, suffers from complacency. Uh, the Feinberg Report, uh, written in 2011, following on the H1N1 outbreak, had three primary recommendations. None of those recommendations were followed through on. If you look back to the Feinberg Report, it is a fantastic prescription and in fact, what WHO has done is really simply mobilize those recommendations now in 2015 instead of mobilizing them as they should have in 2011. And in that respect then, it's not only the failure of, uh, complacency is not limited to the secretariat, uh, it's, it's governing bodies because the governing bodies have a responsibility uh, to um, uh, give the stewardship to the institution that it requires. And uh, they all agreed, uh, uh, not only on um, uh, the accepting the recommendations of the Feinberg Report in 2011, uh, but also on implementation of capacity for the international health regulations in 2007. Yeah. And if you look at the extent to which member states have actually followed through in implementing those, uh, most of them have major shortfalls relative to what's recommendation. So I think on all those fronts, the reasons why uh, we've not uh, had a stronger response. The yeah. two-finger thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you, you all will probably, in your guilty moments, admit that you either read the Da Vinci Code or you saw one of the versions of, of it. Um, that same author, Dan Brown, did an even more ridiculous book called Dante's Inferno. That book imagined that WHO has its own C5A transport and a military cadre dressed in black fatigues that would parachute into epidemics. Um, and that uh, I, though my character was a male, at the Council on Foreign Relations would kidnap the Director General of WHO and hold her in the basement. Um, and that the SWAT teams of, would fly in from Geneva to New York City and rescue her. The point is, I think a lot of people in the world have a vision of WHO in their, somewhere in their imagination that's not too far from Dan Brown's absurd portrayal. In other words, they imagine that it has the capacity, the resources, the money, and the personnel to swoop in like a SWAT team into an epidemic and be there and stop it. And what Tim and I are telling you is that is pure fantasy. It has never existed. And the, the, the bully pulpit capacity of WHO to issue recommendations uh, and announcements is really its, its single strongest weapon, and they chose not to exercise that weapon until August 8th. Hmm. Hossam, so uh, we, we've heard that WHO is not an operational entity. It does not have the C-15 planes to fly in places, but uh, the Red Cross does, and MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders does, and other organizations. And what we saw in this Ebola outbreak was that uh, where WHO did not lead, we saw MSF and Red Cross take a much stronger leadership role in a public way. Uh, be there on the ground and help as they can. But of course, these organizations need need WHO and wants a strong WHO, um, a WHO that wasn't there. So, from your perspective, what uh, 
what, maybe if you can tell or share some stories about what made it, what made your job more difficult because the World Health Organization didn't seem to be there? And what would you have, what would you say is the type of role that from your organization's perspective that you need WHO to be doing? That was a good book, by the way. It was a really good book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I read all. <laughs> okay. um, I, from a field perspective, uh, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of WHO um, over many, many years. And uh, I am struck, often struck, by very demotivated, often cynical colleagues. Um, I think the panel we had before this one was actually really good at highlighting some of the key issues that I think WHO suffers from and through, whether it is the, uh, the infiltration of too much politics, the inability to exercise the mandate, uh, and, and their silos, the rigidity of systems, the change, and, and so on. Um, at 2015, I don't see a role for WHO to be operational anymore because much of the world, many organizations are by far more agile, more capable, more responsible. However, um, we see a, an important role for WHO as perhaps a broker and a catalyst for those who can do the job to get us to do the job and have our backs. The Ebola response suffered from many deficiencies. The science, okay. Um, the supplies, the support systems, uh, sociology and anthropology and so on. And a lot of the world seemed to be learning uh, um, uh, on the fly, so to speak, how to deal with, with this massive new thing that was facing us. And many were coming up with actually very good answers and very good solutions. Um, it would have been fantastic had we, for example, at the right moments, uh, uh, maybe with WHO lead, put in place a, a real-time information sharing platform to answer, help us answer the questions that we're asking ourselves in Canada at the Canadian Red Cross that perhaps in our regions had already figured out uh, and others. And we're all asking the same questions and we're all coming up at various stages with answers, some good, some not so good, but there wasn't that, that real-time information sharing that resulted in, in a sense in delaying the response and therefore more cases and more people dead and more people suffering through. So we are actually now engaged very closely with a part of the WHO that is trying to enable something that they had dismantled a few years back. I don't remember, there, there was, there was an, uh, a part of WHO we dealt with called the HACK, I believe, the Health Action, Crisis. Health Action and Crisis, thank you. And it was completely gutted, and now they're trying to rebuild something like that. We're engaged with them to perhaps this time around help them get it right. Their role uh, and the complementary role of others like MSF, like the Red Cross, like the militaries of the world in the future. This, a collaborative approach, no one can do it alone. And, and no one can do it all. And we need that collaborative approach under some sort of umbrella. And it could be WHO and it could be others. So we heard from uh, Tim, uh, who uh, brought it very much home to, to Canada, specifically to Toronto, uh, talking about Mel Lastman. Um, one of the outcomes of the SARS outbreak uh, that happened uh, over a decade ago was we had a strengthening of, of our international law on uh, how we address pandemics. So by this I'm referring to the international health regulations, which um, many people might know, uh, not know about this, but there actually is a treaty on how we're supposed to respond to uh, pandemic outbreaks. And so one of the things, so Tim, you mentioned many countries around the world uh, haven't built up capacities in order to, that they're supposed to, public health capacities, surveillance and other laboratory systems. But um, even in some of the wealthiest countries, there was some, there were some countries that didn't follow the international health regulations when it came to uh, Ebola. And I'm specifically, there's two wealthy countries that broke the, the, the treaty. Uh, one is Australia, the second is our own country of Canada, uh, by uh, imposing visa restrictions against people uh, coming from West Africa, coming to Canada. That's, uh, that was a violation of um, 
of this treaty, which the World Health Organization had called our government to task force, to task. And we still, to this day, don't issue visas um, to people coming from Guinea. What's, uh, what's your sense of uh, when clearly one of the biggest challenges with the treaty is, is public health capacity in the poorest countries in the world? We're working on that. But what does it mean when our treaty, our international law on this issue, is being violated by a country uh, like Canada? Well, I think it's an indication of uh, the importance of thinking about implementation. Um, but implementation that's evidence-led. Mm -hmm. and, and I think one needs to look at decisions um, on travel restrictions, which um, in many respects um, uh, accentuated the isolation and made, for example, getting supplies into those countries much, much more difficult to the point that a hub had to be established in Accra uh, early on, Accra is in Ghana, um, uh, to try and uh, get supplies from Ghana into uh, each of the three countries. Um, uh, but if you ask the question, what, what, what were travel restrictions achieving? Um, and what's the evidence that this would do anything to either protect travelers or enhance the, uh, uh, you know, the successful control of the epidemic, then it's likely that there wouldn't have been much evidence uh, um, you know, supporting those, uh, those policies. Uh, but I, I do want to point out to um, uh, a culture of fear that takes over, and and, and you know uh, Dan Brown and 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 various uh, journalists and and Hollywood movie uh, directors are very good at 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 touching on the if the fear that emerges in the context of unknown um, invisible pathogens that uh, have outbreak potential. And one of the realities is that um, a lot of air, airlines, pilots, and their crew uh, are unwilling uh, to fly to those destinations. And they'll be saying, uh, we don't want to be put in harm's way. And so um, I, I just want to, I don't want to oversimplify uh, the, the issue of, 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 of uh, being, um, complying with international health treaty, um, the treaty in itself is not going to be sufficient. And one needs to bring real evidence and reason uh, to bear in decisions, uh, and I think that would have been helpful. But I just want to focus a little bit more. One of the great challenges we had in the context of the response to Ebola uh, was um, uh, trying to secure safe medical evacuation. Um, and there was only one plane one plane on the planet that was equipped with um, respiratory precautions that would deem it safe for a crew uh, to fly out a patient that was sick. Only one. Uh, and I think today there may be four. Um, uh, so that doesn't get into the issues then of negotiating airspace because no country uh, wants to be, have a plane land for emergency purposes if it's carrying an Ebola bomb. Mm -hmm. And so the challenges of negotiating airspace in the context of outbreak are, are also extremely important. Uh, and so, Steve, what I'm trying to, to push here uh, is that um, a treaty will never be sufficient to cover all of the issues that are inherent in managing a complex outbreak. And I think the capacity that we need to engender much more fundamentally is real-time management of the complex issues in a much more efficient um, and effective way. Great. I, uh, I want to uh, so close this chapter in terms of talking about institutional failure, because that's only uh, the first part of the theme of this conference, uh, to now talk about institutional adaptation. So some oh, of the... Can I say something about oh, you the want, IHR then? Do you want to... Uh, yeah, uh, actually, maybe can I... Um, well, let me ask the question. Maybe you can tie it into uh, to your next... Because uh, I think it, it's very relevant. Uh, in the sense, I'd like to go talk about adaptation in that what we saw is during the outbreak, there were some changes. That institutions started to realize this was a, a different kind of outbreak in need of a different kind of response. And there were different institutions that 
stood up to the plate and uh, tried to do things differently. Uh, so, uh, Laurie, for example, you mentioned, I'd love to give you the, the microphone first. Um, you mentioned uh, UN MIRS. Uh, so this was uh, the first time ever that the United Nations launched uh, essentially a, a, human, a, a unique uh, peacekeeping mission of a sort, but for uh, a medical emergency. So it was quite, quite a unique response uh, of a mobilization, but there was also this existing UN architecture to do that, like OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Um, with Tim, we saw with the World Bank took, took an important role thinking through uh, global health financing and fi making financing available within countries. Certainly, uh, the Red Cross had different uh, issues uh, or uh, different uh, innovations in trying to mobilize and work with other actors like MSF, joint training, uh, and getting to country, working through insurance issues, and being able to pull people if they um, did uh, if they contracted the virus. So I'd love to hear thoughts on um, how institutions changed over the course of the outbreak. But Laurie, maybe I can give it to you first. Uh, talk about well, a couple no. quick things first. I, I want to say. Uh, Hossam, I don't know if you personally realize how courageous and valuable the Red Cross volunteers are in these outbreaks. In 1995 in Kikwit, I have no hesitation whatsoever in saying that it was, was the unpaid volunteer force of the Red Cross that I saw stop that epidemic. They did it. And they did it with almost no support from International Red Cross, no protective gear to speak of. Um, and t a, a fair t death toll among their volunteers. And you saw very much the same thing in Liberia. I saw it on the ground all over Sierra Leone. And uh, I think when you hear the news reports, the world stopped an epidemic, you may not put in your mind the idea that these are volunteers in whatever gear is provided to them and whatever knowledge is provided to them about how to protect themselves. And so, heroes, truly, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And on the IHR, um, I mean, the bottom line with the international health regulations, it took 14 years to write something that the World Health Assembly would vote yes to. Every country wanted a treaty that would be weak enough that an outside force couldn't come into their nation and say, you have an epidemic and you got to get it together. Or tell other countries, they're lying as China did and covering up as China did with SARS. And so the IHR exists, let's not un understate that, but it's toothless. There is no, nothing written in the IHR that says that all those airlines that refuse to fly their routes um, into West Africa and some are still not flying their routes into West Africa, that that's okay or that there's some penalty they have to pay. There's nothing written in any inter international institutional law that says that when you stand up at the General Assembly meeting in September 2014 and say, my country commits X hundred million dollars to support this great fight and then never actually cut a check and never actually disperse a dime, you pay no penalty whatsoever. You get the political rah-rah on the front end, and there's no, no accountability, no name and shame, no foot to the fire when you don't come through. So the Secretary General uh, felt some sense of desperation about the situation in West Africa in early September, felt that not only had WHO been slow, but that the countries themselves were in dire need, didn't have the resources, and so created this thing, UNMIR, the United Nations Medical Ebola Emergency Relief or Response, whatever it stands for, response. And um, it was, came into existence shortly after World Bank, under the leadership of Jim Kim, said, I'm calling for a round of funding, and let's get the ball rolling here. Um, UNMIR was, was created almost from the very beginning to be a failure in the sense that it aspired to take a humanitarian response model, you know, famines, earthquakes, uh, refugees, and take that template and put it on top of what was a public health emergency. And you had people mobilizing food and mobilizing jets to go flying around with various kinds of supplies that would be appropriate to an earthquake or 
uh, a famine, but not really in any way appropriate as priority needs in an ep epidemic. Um, and meanwhile, the things that would have really ma mattered, and um, you know, Hassan touched on this when you were talking about communication. You know, you can't just pick up the phone in Monrovia and call a colleague in Freetown, right? The phone systems do not talk to each other. And you can't just pick up the phone in Monrovia and call a colleague who's out in the field trying to put out something at a village level because they don't have cell phone coverage. So the kinds of communication systems that could have been put in place at very low cost that would have allowed uh, a Red Cross leader working in, um, say, Kerrytown in Sierra Leone to compare notes with a Red Cross leader working in uh, West Point of Monrovia and say, this is what worked and didn't work, or here's what we did when the rioters attacked us for trying to remove the bodies and three of our people had to be hospitalized with injuries. Here's how we did it, here's how we did it. There was never the possibility, and there still is not today, of that kind of communication that empowers local responders. So what was truly um, anger provoking for me was to see on the ground smart Liberian epidemiologist has an insight. Smart Sierra Leonean epidemiologist has an insight. They have no way to talk to each other. So they have to send their insights to Geneva where a bunch of folks at WHO massage the data for a while and then send out down two weeks later some sort of analysis. And UNMIR was the same. So you would have some person way off in the hinterland saying, well, we think that people have a food shortage over there. And by the time this goes up the UNMIR chain, it's, quote, there's a famine probability in Liberia. There was no famine probability in Liberia. You drop a seed in the ground and you got a tree in two days in Liberia. The, this, the, the only people who had food shortages were people placed under quarantine who couldn't go out and get food. And so I felt like we, we took care of one institutional failure, WHO, by creating an even more massive, giant, humongous institutional failure, UNMIR. Hassam, uh, what about uh, the Red Cross? Uh, so the question is, how did our global health institutions adapt throughout the Ebola outbreak? How did the Red Cross uh, adapt? Thank you, Laurie, for recognizing the volunteers. In fact, this was, we recognized early on that if, if Ebola was to be defeated, it was to be at source and at the community level working with these volunteers. Often stigmatized, ostracized, um, and still, and in fact, one of the programs we're running now, uh, because many are not accepted back into their communities to date. And we're, now we're trying to find them as the Red Cross proper shelters around the countries affected. And this is tough, it's not over. And these are real people and families completely impacted because they essentially stepped up and really were the true heroes uh, on the ground. Uh, and the, we are focusing a lot of our current efforts, in fact, in a proper safety network, insurance support for this volunteer network. Many were not insured. Not a single Canadian delegate. We, we deployed 58 people from Canada to be at the forefront of the Ebola response. They were all insured to the maximum you can. They were all protected. We had all kinds of mechanisms and medivacs to bring them back. None of the volunteers on the ground had any of that in place. And this is a failure, I would say, of our Red Cross movement to still, okay, to recognize the importance of this. And there are many challenges. Some are beyond our control. Colleagues in, in Guinea, I was talking to last week in Montreal, in fact, were in the Ministry of Health, were saying how their own politicians refused to recognize how severe and how serious this was, um, despite the warnings they were getting from their own technocrats in the Ministry of Health. It wasn't until Air France and British Airways suspended flights that the politicians uh, decided to act. So th there are multiple Okay, um, failures at, uh, at that. So there are many other things I can talk about, but really for us now, it's about enabling that volunteer network. Many of the lessons we should have learned fighting the cholera epidemic in Haiti in 2010, 
in dealing with communities that were absolutely fearful, that were stoning the, the, the aid workers and the volunteers, that were uh, refusing assistance, that were in some cases uh, um, uh, dumping the, 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 the cholera victims uh, away to die. We learned a lot in that response on how to deal with communities rejecting, fearing. We learned that in Zimbabwe in 2008, cholera. But somehow that does not uh, make it to from lesson learned to lesson implemented in our global humanitarian and response system. Tim, I'd love to hear about some of the, uh, the adaptations uh, that uh, the World Bank uh, faced uh, or undertook, um, I guess especially given uh, the head of the World Bank at the moment. Uh, it's probably the first time and maybe only time our, our World Bank has a, has a physician at the, char at the head. So what, what some are some of the changes that uh, the World Bank uh, undertook during the outbreak? Well, thanks, Steve. And let me begin uh, by just sort of recognizing that the, the most important adaptation happened on the ground. And, and when I visited uh, Monrovia in October, which was uh, just to past the peak of, of, of really the, the very, very dark months of, of uh, August and September, when, when uh, the head of state herself thought uh, that, uh, quote unquote, she thought everybody was gonna die in Liberia. It was, it was that bleak at that time. Um, but uh, what I was struck by at that time was the extent to which uh, communities had rallied um, in the poorest areas of Monrovia. Uh, and there was a network that was supporting uh, people uh, to stay in their houses. Um, and they brought them food and water because um, they were uh, respecting and trying to respect a self-imposed quarantine so that they wouldn't uh, potentially be infectious to people outside their households. Um, and the extent to which you had these volunteers mobilized and doing this with virtually no resources was inspirational to say the least. Um, the bank um, uh, uh, was, uh, like everybody else, uh, too late into this in retrospect. Um, on August 4th, uh, we announced $200 million. Um, we were the first international responders to make a major commitment. Uh, but at that time, we thought $200 million, because $100 million would allow us to deal with the acute emergency, and then we would put $100 million into strengthening um, uh, systems for the future. Uh, so we massively underestimated the scale of the problem. Uh, at that point of time, uh, but we followed it up um, uh, in uh, a little bit later when uh, we said that uh, we have a major issue related to the surge response uh, of international responders and we put a hundred million dollars uh, again into end-to-end uh, -end planning for the workforce uh, because as Hassan said, um, finding international volunteers uh, was not easy. Unlike other crises, uh, the tsunami in Asia, um, where there were uh, a thousand boats uh, full of volunteers looking for survivors, um, uh, there was not the same uh, surge response in the international community, in part because of the concern, uh, but also in part because of the, the issues of logistics related to mobilizing people for a complex infectious emergency. Um, and so we helped uh, UN Ops, WHO, and the Africa Union uh, mobilize workforce. Um, what uh, happens in a crisis is that institutions often um, uh, you know, act in ways which they don't uh, during non-crisis period. And so uh, we got things through our board at the bank, which normally takes between six years and six months, uh, um, or six months and six years, uh, uh, in six days. Uh, and so we got resources out to the front lines, um, governments and international responders uh, uh, in, a, in a, an exceptionally short period of time. We also looked at um, issues related to uh, bringing attention to the costs uh, of inaction uh, and uh, calculated the, the billion dollar price tag for the West Africa region related to uh, the 
implicit sanctions that were essentially being imposed because of the, uh, the crisis, uh, but as well as quantifying the health costs uh, in terms of um, the consequences of losing uh, 200, 300 health workers in health systems that are always already constrained. And, and, and that may be difficult in an audience like this to understand uh, just how critical uh, the loss of health workers was. Uh, but let me put it in stark terms. Um, there's one medical school in Liberia. Uh, prior to the crisis, it had 20 faculty. Okay, this is a population of 4 million. One medical school, 20 faculty pre-crisis. Post-crisis, it has 10 faculty. Five of their faculty died and five migrated. So 10 faculty for a population of 4 million. Uh, Ottawa has, what, 500,000 million, 500, people? How about half a million? A million? Okay. And University of Ottawa has how many faculty? 5,000? So think of that. One medical school for serving the greater Ottawa region and think of Liberia with 10 faculty post-crisis, 20 pre-crisis, and you can get a sense of the extent to which the HR dimensions are ones that we have to take uh, very seriously. The last thing I'd say on, on innovation, uh, we do have, um, uh, uh, as our president, uh, somebody who's trained in infectious diseases and with whom I worked with at WHO, um, and, and also earlier, um, and uh, he was extremely concerned by the complacency on many fronts, but uh, he used the bank's convening power in early September uh, to ask the tough questions, which no one seemed to want to ask, which was, where's the plan? What is the plan? How are we organizing? How are we collectively coming together? And that is not only the plan to deal with the existing crisis, it's also the plan to deal with future crises. Because we can say with a Ebola, um, if this is a test case for a virulent uh, um, uh, flu virus that is transmitted much more quickly, uh, we're in a lot of trouble from a global health security perspective if we deal with something that's transmitted much, much more quickly. And so we're spending a tremendous amount of time right now together with others looking at uh, how do we design uh, the system to prepare and respond for something that will be much more challenging in the future. And I think that's got no simple answer, but uh, we have to get something into place now before uh, we do what we often do post-crises, is forget what happened and hope it will never happen again until it happens again. And that is uh, that tough question without simple uh, answers is exactly the tough question I'm about to ask uh, our panelists. Um, then go talking now about institutional innovation. Um, it makes it would be so unfortunate if we had this situation and we didn't, as you said, Tim, if we didn't learn anything from it and if we didn't make real change to our global institutions uh, in order to make sure that we're better prepared for next time. So let me start uh, when talking about innovation. Let me start maybe a bit uh, theoretically. Do you? Um, does the panel, uh, I'd be keen to find out, maybe Hossam, we can start with you. Is, uh, is, are crises like these opportunities for us to really seize the day and try to make big changes? So Trotsky famously talked about war as the locomotive of history. Is uh, perhaps our crises like Ebola, is this a supersonic jet of institutional innovation? Is this, maybe, is this our time when we're maybe going to see some major change we wouldn't otherwise see? So, uh, Hossam? It certainly can. Um, um, the evidence before us historically sadly suggests otherwise. Because I'm, I'm not sure if we really um, need new innovation as such that is so radical. I think many of the answers are out there. I think be, many of the reforms required at WHO were out there with the H1N1 uh, recommendations. And similarly in, in, in uh, in my world, the humanitarian world, many of the things we 
we need to do are well known to us. Many of the deficiencies, and there are many, uh, are known to us. And, and this is a continuous um, development mode we're in, uh, to the best of our abilities and, and, and resources. I think the, um, what we need is leadership and political will to make this happen. And this is where, quickly after, uh, a crisis like this, we soon forget and move on, and, and, and the motivation and the will disappear. Um, yes, there were some things that could have been done better and so on. We've documented those. We can probably roll those out uh, from a technical and medicine and science and sociological perspective uh, uh, better than the, the next time round. Um, but uh, what I feel we're missing is this courageous, compassionate leadership, okay, that is willing to tackle those tough things and, and not let politics, often domestic politics, trump, okay, humanitarian need and, secu and health security out there. Lori, what's, uh, what are our prospects for global institutional change as a result of the Ebola outbreak? Well, you're, we've had two big reports already saying here's what needs to change focused on WHO. There will be three more coming out in the next uh, two, three months. Um, and then WHO's executive board will reconvene in January and uh, presumably cherry pick, you know, what are the most palatable of the many recommendations, the easiest for them to absorb, not necessarily the things they most should do. Um, and there may be some fine tuning, who knows. Uh, but overall, I, I don't think institutions like to be compelled from the outside to change. They're not good at it, um, and they don't appreciate the outside meddling. Uh, and WHO is no different. Uh, World Bank wouldn't be any different. Um, and the long list of institutions we talked about. I mean, I think the, what's perhaps an easier way for everybody to wrap your head, head around this is to take a couple of key examples of things that were impediments to a speedy response that are not at the scale of an entire institution. So one that was mentioned here was insurance. And another that was mentioned here was medevac, and actually the two come together in the sense that if one of you as a physician, a Canadian citizen, wish to volunteer through, let's say, um, uh, instead of MSF, let's pick uh, uh, International Medical Corps, and you wish to volunteer and go to Sierra Leone, the first obvious question your family would ask is, if you get sick, what happens? Will you be flown back to Canada? Will you have insurance to pay for your treatment? Well, as it turned out, just about every single insurance company um, invoked, uh, uh, what's the word in Latin? De uh, oh, force majeure. Thank you. Right, that was hard. Um, <laughs> invoked force majeure and said, therefore, we decline to honor the following 25 provisions of your insurance policy. So if you get Ebola, you're on your own. Uh, if you need medevac, we won't pay for it. If you need, if there's difficulty in special conditions of flight, we won't be there for you. And similarly, medevac itself, you know, having these special planes designed to emergency airlift out infected individuals um, turns out to be something that many governments had previously said they were going to do, including mine and that they were going to develop fleets of special medevac planes, and they've never done them. So if you were to take the medevac and insurance piece and ask, where's the institutional reform here? How do we ensure that the next time the insurance companies don't get away with declaring force majeure, and the next time we really have medevac capacity and we have the ability to pay for it, and the individuals not build $100,000 after they get to the United States. Oh, by the way, here's the price tag for your medevac. Um, those are seemingly easy pieces, and yet I don't honestly see any movement at all, and I don't really believe that the, it'll be any better the next major outbreak or pandemic we face. So I'm not terribly optimistic. Just to quickly follow up on that, Lori. Um, so if, you, if you're not optimistic about change after this crisis, which gathered so much public attention and so much media attention and 
uh, what, what kind of outbreak, what kind of pandemic outbreak do we need that will actually lead to institutional innovation in your minds? I know that you were a consultant for the movie Contagion, which really, um, uh, which is why the movie is so accurate from a global health governance <laughs> perspective. I've used it in my teaching. It shows uh, it's so accurate, thanks to Laurie, from a governance um, perspective. But what do we need? A, do we need a kind of outbreak like we saw in that uh, very scary movie? When will we actually? What do we need to actually? Well, we had to have change? SARS to get p the motivation to finally push the international health regulations through. Um, I mean, look, what's the worst case scenario that is not science fiction? It is that one of the now record number of bird flu strains in circulation on planet Earth comes up with the right genetic recombination event to become a human-to-human -human transmissible, highly virulent influenza. So, I mean, for the first time in history, we have um, several different genetic lineages of uh, avian flu, um, H7N9, H5N1, H3N2, uh, H5N6, H5N8. The list is huge, and every one of them, when individual humans have become infected, the mortality rates, the low one is like 30%, and they go all the way up to 70% um, mortality rates. So to put that in perspective, the 1918 influenza actually had a less than 2% mortality rate. So the huge numbers of deaths is because it was incredibly contagious. And uh, in, even in the absence of commercial air travel, it went around the world twice in one and a half years. And most of the planet was exposed. So if you think that the best estimate is 75 million people perished worldwide in 1918 and 19 from that flu, less than 2% mortality rate. Now look at these flus that are out there lurking with recombination events occurring and imagine something that, let's say, currently has a 40% mortality rate and you say, well, you know, when it, when it takes on the cargo to become human transmissible genetically, it'll lose some of its virulence cargo, fine let it lose half of its virulence cargo, come down to 20%. That is still two orders of magnitude more dangerous than the 1918 influenza. So I think if you were to ask for a consensus from the microbiology, infectious disease, public health community, what would, what would be the worst case scenario and what horribly might it take to get the sorts of reforms we think really need to happen, um, it is a highly virulent human-to-human -human transmissible influenza. Tim, do you agree? I, I do, and, uh, but I'm a little bit more optimistic than Lori, um, and, and, and let me say why. First, um, I think uh, on the reason that uh, we need to act now and, and again, uh, not be complacent in the wake of this crisis. Um, all of the, the best evidence and I stress evidence because this country is so much more attuned to scientific evidence now. And it suggests that uh, within the next uh, 30 years, there will be uh, the sort of scenario that Lori uh, has just uh, alluded to. Uh, and we know that the modelers are suggesting uh, that the death toll would be somewhere around 30 million globally. And the cost to the global economy uh, somewhere between four and eight trillion dollars. Now, with that knowledge based on evidence, uh, this is an issue that global leaders can't ignore. And so, um, with that in front of us, and with the experience of, of where the shortfalls in the system exist, uh, then I don't think there's any choice but to begin to put in place, not the perfect system, but a system that we know will be much better and able to respond. So let me just say a couple of things that we at the World Bank are trying to do on this front. Uh, we identified in the context of the last crisis that the financing um, for uh, pandemic preparedness and response is grossly insufficient. Um, if you ask any of the responders, one of the reasons it was so difficult to move things quickly is that many of the agencies that need to respond uh, have very limited contingency that allows them to respond without raising more resources. Uh, this is across the board. Um, and so what we are trying to do is create a system of financing uh, 
uh, which will immediately release resources at the agreement of a certain threshold or trigger of outbreak, um, dealt, done in consultation with individuals and institutions that can give some sense of when we're uh, reaching a, a, a threshold that requires mobilization, but then to make sure that there's sufficient financing at sufficient scale and speedy enough that it allows those first responders to act much more early and, and at that, in that way um, snuff out uh, a problem before it has a chance uh, to spread. Or in the case of a high, highly virulent uh, uh, influenza, prepare systems to respond uh, recognizing that there's, there's, there are no opportunities for containment. We're doing this through a number of me mechanisms uh, and instruments under something we call a pandemic emergency financing facility. Uh, we've been working with WHO and other partners on this, but it really looks at mobilizing uh, new instruments. Um, uh, insurance is one where we've had actually a lot of response, and that's because reinsurers recognize that if we do incur uh, that pandemic Armageddon that uh, uh, Lori referred to, um, their business, which is the business of supporting continuity in businesses globally, will be wiped out. And so they see this as a major threat to their, uh, their business interests and are very interested, therefore, in trying to get a much more effective um, insurance for pandemics, which would allow countries and international responders uh, to move much more quickly and definitively in the context of a crisis. So I think that's one thing. The second, oh, the last if, thing... Oh, if I, can, I see okay. we only have uh, five more minutes, but maybe you might be able to give a second um, in the context of my last question that I'd love to ask all three panelists, which is um, we have a new government here in Canada. Uh, if you were in the elevator with, the, with our new Prime Minister, our new Minister of Health, uh, going up to the, let's say, uh, the 60th floor, so that you have, let's say, a minute uh, to, to give uh, advice to our, our Prime Minister as to what's the one single most important thing that they can champion to strengthen global health institutions. So, uh, Tim, I, um, maybe I'll, oh, no, you, did, if you want to go first, because if, if you want to, maybe you can weave in the other parts into that. Okay, you're challenging my cognitive uh, <laughs> ability once again. I was hoping to have more time to think on this. But uh, let me finish first um, very quickly, is, is that I think um, globally we need to uh, complement anything any single institution does with a stronger sense of joint accountability. And I think coming out of this, um, crisis and moving forward with a stronger sense of what we need to uh, prepare and respond in the future is a stronger sense of what that governance framework uh, is that allows and demands a joint accountability. And we need to think very creatively about what that looks like institutionally. Because if it's left up to the World Bank or WHO, we'll find every excuse in the world to justify post facto what we did without recognizing where we need to change and improve. And so that's uh, very critical. But if I had the opportunity, um, first I, I'd, I'd congratulate uh, the Prime Minister on changing the name of uh, 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 foreign affairs uh, from defeated to global, uh, 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 whatever it is, Global Affairs Canada. But I would have gone further. I think they should have gone to something, an acronym like GANYE, uh, which is from defeated to win. Um, and, and, and brought in uh, not only um, uh, gl uh, global um, affairs for governance, uh, uh, to negotiate equitable resilience across countries. Uh, so that's my half-baked acronym, but I do think um, uh, my recommendation to uh, the Prime Minister is when he says uh, uh, his one message to the global community that uh, don't worry, Canada is back, I'm really encouraged, but what I would love to see uh, is that back is looking forward in such a way that it's going to bring uh, a leadership uh, related to uh, the governance reforms that we need to think about, which are not specific to this issue, uh, but relate to complex global challenges and really lending Canada's commitment uh, to knowledge, 
and strengthening capacity in all countries and being part of joint uh, solutions. So whatever institutional mechanism that might take, I think that would be an extremely exciting way forward for Canada. Mm. Laurie, what's the uh, one single thing you would s suggest to our new Prime Minister Trudeau to do, to champion global health security and governance? C'est dommage, je suis américaine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With, uh, so maybe even more so, as, as an American, uh, just south of our border, what would be the one thing you'd like to see for you, a foreign government, to uh, really champion? Well, uh, short term or long term? I mean, uh, long term. I mean, recognizing we're, we're not the look, United uh, States, uh, we're uh, smaller. There, but, uh, I, I see important. two really obvious things that are like low hanging fruit right now. One is for Canada to take a big role in an effort that President Obama ha has kick started to try and assist countries to meet the terms of the international health regulations, develop their surveillance capacity, disease response capacity, laboratory skills training, um, support their uh, uh, civil society mechanisms like the Red Cross. And, the, and then I would say, you know, Canada is going to play a big role uh, over the next crucial five years in how we come to interpret the SDGs. You know, they've been passed. There's 17 of them with 169 targets. It's an impossibly huge plate. but. One of them, number three, is guarantee health for all, and under there are a set of health provisions. If, if it is, if, if the Prime Minister feels that this urgency is high enough, I hope he does, then I hope that the way Canada engages in the health component of the SDG process is to really reinforce the necessity to build health systems that can detect and respond to epidemics that can actually protect their populations from microbial outbreaks. Great, and then Hassam, the final word. Um, two very important things. Please invest in preparedness. If you want a, a response to be fast and efficient and effective, now is the time to invest from the local to the global. It's not about only in global institutions. It's about making sure that the volunteers in the village in Liberia know what to do when the next round hits or in Nepal. Now is the time to invest and stay the course. And the second, when crisis hits, and they will, and they do, have our backs. Systems need to flex for us to do our job. We cannot, you cannot fit Ebola into the timelines and the templates of projects that exist and frames that exist with the bureaucracy. We want to be partners with the bureaucracy and government to do the right thing, and that means we can help define the problem and find the solutions together and not just be treated as recipients of assistance and dollars and implementers. Great, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to your panel. Um, I think that this panel has done a remarkable job of giving us really uh, impressive insights into the scale of the challenge that is, in, that is facing us, and also uh, the extent of the hard work that's, uh, that their institutions and uh, individuals involved uh, with those institutions uh, put into this. Um, you, Hassam ended by, by talking about collaboration. Uh, I'm left with the idea that you know, everybody has a little piece of the solution. And I think that there are people in this room who have um, bigger pieces than others, but everybody does have a piece. And I don't think that, considering the fact that one could have heard a pin drop in this room uh, for an hour and a half, I looked around me at one point and saw every face wrapped. I think that uh, people will be leaving this room with, in their minds, ideas for uh, how they can exercise that piece. So thank you.